I also wanted to throw a brick. I just wanted to break something. Mm -hmm. I was angry. And I was around mm. a lot of angry youth who just wanted to break yeah. something out of agony yeah. over our hopes being extinguished right before our very eyes, our hopes for a brighter future. I had hopes that an education and an attitude of uh, respecting others and, and being respected, I had hopes that that would have a wonderful outcome. And it, that had an impact on me. King's assassination most definitely had an impact on me. This is Where You're From, an origin story podcast at the intersection of faith and culture that digs into the influences and experiences that shape who we are today. Join us as we gain insight into the Bible's wisdom for all, regardless of where we're from. Hey, y'all, this is Ross Sulberry. Thanks for joining me on Where You're From. I had the honor of sitting down with a mentor and friend, our Daily Bread Ministries own Joyce Dinkins. And I got to say, she has a beautifully rich story that I know you're going to love listening to. Joyce Dinkins is a writer, editor, speaker, and mentor with 35 years of experience in Christian publishing. She directs publishing in color and serves on the board of the Academy of Christian Editors and the Evangelical Christian Publishing Association. Whew. You can find out more about Joyce Dinkins and her work in the show notes or by going to whereyoufrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Please join me as I ask Miss Joyce, where you're from? Well, I'm from two individuals, Lois Virginia Powell Wheeler and William Archie Wheeler, who were servants migrating out of Georgia to the North, toward the end of the Great Migration, around 1946, I believe it was, that they came North. Uh, literally, according to my dad, they hitchhiked a ride with hmm. another servant, domestic servant, to get out of many things, to get out of the threats of violence against my father, who was a six-foot-three, beautiful, black-skinned a uh, hard worker, son of a slave, who would not take kindly at any injustice against him or against his loved ones. He needed to get out of that environment. And my mother, who had met him at Daytona Beach, Florida, my mother was doing cartwheels on the beach. She was five foot three and a quarter. And she was gorgeous, athletic, and strong. And the two of them met and um, fell in love, and they got out of the South. And they loved the South, but they needed to get away. And so they headed north, and I was born at the Negro Hospital. Mm -hmm. I was delivered by a black doctor, because at that time in 1950, when I was born, it was not common practice for European American doctors to minister to serve Negroes. So I was born at Evanston Community Hospital. My parents were domestic workers, and I'm the youngest of my father's seven children and my mother's four. Okay, so already there's so many textures and layers to what you just shared. So if we go back, you mentioned that your father's father was born into slavery. Yes. Um, and I can't say I, I know many people who that is true of, right? Yeah, folks sometimes think you're stretching it if you say that, <laughs> but it's the truth. I've been to the headstone. I've been to the graveyard. I have photos. Uh, my grandfather was born in 1858 in Georgia. Mm. Millard mm. Wheeler was his name. Okay. Millard mm -hmm. Wheeler. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that feels so proximate, right? Like when I think about my grandparents, like I knew them, I had deep relationship. Tell me about in both positive and negative ways, how that reality of your father's father being enslaved shaped him and therefore shaped you. Oh, that's a chapter or 
five chapters in a book. Mm. I've been carrying their stories all my life. So how that shaped my father, um, my dad was shaped by his dad's lack of personhood and with a desire for freedom amidst abject poverty. He had the energy, he had the hopes, he had the uh, intellect, a brilliant man. But his father was shackled by slavery, but my father was shackled by the same systems uh, that mm. sought to keep his mind enslaved, his character enslaved to a a false personality, a false narrative that he should not strive, that he should not hope, that he could not have dreams, that he could not achieve. Maybe it'd be helpful to understand, like if you could just unpack a little bit how you have come to learn how those systems sought to keep your dad in bondage in various ways. Like how did that manifest itself specifically? It manifested itself this way. My, my dad read everything he could get his hands on. He was mm. denied education, except the wonderful education that he received through the churches that his family founded, the black churches, where they had an opportunity to learn uh, to read and to multiply, etc. But my dad wanted to learn. So the absence of that opportunity to learn and to grow and to explore and to dream and to understand life, my dad read voraciously. Understand that he was 45 when I was born. So my, my father was a grown man when I came into yeah. the world, and a grown man with a, <laughs> a diverse set of experiences. And I sat mm. and watched him read, and I would ask and interchange questions with him from the back of the newspaper. I would ask him what a headline meant. So uh, the lack of opportunity manifested in a vigorous drive to empower his children, to be empowered himself, to be free, to have the simple freedoms of being able to make a decision of what you're going to do in a day when you get up in the morning, compared to his father, who, as he described it, uh, was like a pair of shoes. His father was like an inanimate object. He was mm. objectified and, and uh, was like a pair of shoes that someone took and put on in the morning. My father wanted to stand on his own he wanted to protect his family. He wanted to afford me all that was absent in his life, education and provision and care, security. Yeah, and I'm just doing the math here that one thing you share in common uh, with your dad was that his dad also had him later in life, you know, later than what we would typically see. If and he had 12 siblings. That's how they used to <laughs> kick him out back then. So did your dad talk much about his dad to you? Yes, he did. And uh, my youngest mm. adult is uh, named after my grandfather. Mm. I've never seen pictures of my grandfather, but my dad told stories. He told stories about my grandfather. Mm. One that I can remember is uh, he was a sharecropper, mm. striver. He had 13 miles to feed. My grandfather and my father were plowing, and my grandfather told my father to hold the mule and to wait for him. He had to go do something, and my grandfather, Millard, had to go to the local store, and the store owner had, the story goes, sold my, my father's sister a bad piece of meat. So... Millard's daughter had been denied uh, justice at the food store, <laughs> okay, or at the local store. <laughs> My grandfather went and confronted. Well, well, you didn't do that. A black man didn't confront a white store owner in 1915. But my grandfather did. And in fact, when he came back, my dad said that my grandfather's work shirt was uh, torn. And he said, 
very quietly got in a little tussle. <laughs> Which means he was scrapping. He was scrapping with the white store owner over the indignity that had been done to his daughter mm. and to him and his family. Mm. So he was protesting. Millard was a protester. Mm. Wow. I mean, sounds like a remarkable man. Okay, so then this transition happens. And obviously, you know, you mentioned some of the indignities that your dad experienced. And what part of Georgia was this, by the way? My father was born in Lafayette, or Lafayette, as okay. they would say it. So Lafayette, <laughs> mm. Georgia was where my dad was born. And my mother was born in Cairo, Georgia. But they were both uh, working, my father as a chauffeur and a butler and a cook and a nanny <laughs> for <laughs> a, uh, as I understand it, a doctor and his family. And my mother was a servant, a domestic, mm -hmm. outstanding bread maker, cook. They were both working on Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, and they proceeded to, in 1946, to head north. And north ended up being Evanston, Chicago land, right? Yes, yes. They lived on the place. That's an old terminology, but to living on the place meant they worked for wealthy people on the north shore of Chicago in uh, homes that were expansive, that were estates, that had servants' quarters. That's where my parents first uh, lived. And then they moved into the black neighborhood because, you know, you talk in 1946, 1950 when I was born. This is before the Fair Housing Act. This is before Brown versus Board of Education. This before is the, the civil rights movement. Wow. And I was born on the North Shore in a wealthy enclave north of the city of Chicago predominantly European-American residents, but there had historically been uh, black people in that community, black people who had migrated from the South, who had skills, and who established residences in an elite community. Um, they had their own businesses. They were not all servants, but many of them were servants, but they had their skills, and that's where we landed, and that's where I grew up, in an environment where I had everything that my father and mother had been denied. And that is a really interesting contrast that you're kind of drawing out. Like on the one end, there's this sense that you live in a, a world or you were born in the midst of a context where a lot of the rights and you know laws that we just take for granted nowadays were not in place or, or were not enforced. And yet at the same time, there still was a sense of a upgrade of experience from what your parents experienced. Most um, definitely. And this is one of the, the interesting aspects of like the pre integration world is that when you are forced to be together, there are ways in which you make do and, and celebrate and embrace aspects of your culture and your life and like you weren't walking around every day like man if only you know <laughs> the fair housing act would be enacted my life would be meaningful like it sounded like you felt like you were having a sense of fulfillment as much as you could see at that point yeah i didn't have my parents worries and they had all the perspective in the world to afford me what they believed we all have a right to. And they were wary of the forces, really forces of evil mm. that would try to prevent me from accessing freedom. That's interesting that you put it in those terms. And I, I want to double click because you did mention that you had some church planners up in there. You had some prayer warriors and some some church leaders. Tell me a little bit about what that was, that that heritage, and how it shaped some of just the concept of how you were thinking about the struggles of life. Well, I knew from uh, an early age to pray. My mother taught me to pray. I can see myself on my knees next to my mother. And my mother taught me to read. And my dad 
also encouraged me to read and he encouraged me to write. And I was aware of all the stories of what they had been through, the hunger, the denials, the lack of safety, the attacks. I was aware of those things, but the world that they put before me from a very young age, we were living, you know, that TV show, A Different World, but Mm -hmm. we were in a different world. Now, what was the question, Russell? Take me back. What was your question? Yeah. So, man, I got so caught up in your story. I, I kind of lost up it myself. Too, so, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I guess I um, just wanted to pull on that thread a little bit about like you said, they were aware of the evil, the forces of evil that would try to harm you. And I just thought that was an interesting way that you remembered couching something that sometimes people just see as social issues, but that you understood it in a spiritual framework. Yeah, they taught me to pray. They pointed out evil right? and then taught us how to navigate it. We talk these days about the talk, you know, and we reference that and we reference often when we say about the talk, we reference uh, what do you do when you're come upon by the police, right? Mm -hmm or by those who might attack you, physically attack right. you. Right. But the talk that they gave us was abroad. They, they addressed that because we lived in a community where we were not uh, supposed to be. Uh, mm-hmm. We lived in a community where people constantly, when they saw us in the classroom, on the streets, uh, in the stores, uh, at the beach, that had just been desegregated only four years before I was born. All right, but they taught us that racism exists, but that you're an individual. And they taught us not to hate people, even though there were people who hated us just because of what we, our appearance. They protected us. But I was, I was aware of the same, I'll say it, racist, demonic spirit that had put my grandfather in bondage, I was aware that it was still yet alive. I'm aware today that it's still yet alive. But my parents taught us, it's really a miracle, they taught us to love. Mm. They taught us to love one another in the household, taught us to love our neighbor, and they taught us by their actions. My home was a place where People from all over the world would come. Students from Northwestern University in, in Evanston. Yeah, right there in Evanston. Yeah. Uh, would hear about my parents, our household, and they would come in and sit and listen to the history and learn about slavery and the uh, black experience in the South and about what my parents talked about and showed the love for the individual the acknowledgement of the individual human being. And so I watched freedom in my living room. I experienced freedom in my classrooms where I was free to learn. And at the same time, I was protected when the teacher might uh, mistreat because there were instructors who were racist, who were unfair in their treatment of us in the classroom. Mm. And my mother and father would show up. I have to say, I felt sometimes like they were there every day, but they would show up to confront the instructor. How did that make you feel to like... Protected. It made you feel protected. Strong, Mm. free, Mm. certain, confident Mm. that I had a right to be wherever the Lord had me. I had a right to be there. Now we didn't we didn't pray a lot about the Lord. We didn't talk about a, a lot about the Lord at home. Mm-hmm. My dad was disgusted by hypocrisy, Christian hypocrisy. And he was he was disgusted by some of the in particular the imagery that was uh foisted upon people to suggest that everything good is white and everything mm-hmm evil is black. He was disgusted by that. And so the iconography in churches, whether they were black churches or white churches, my dad did not want us exposed to that and did not want us exposed to hypocrisy. And so we were not a church-going family, but my mother 
was a prayer, and she would mm-hmm. send us to Sunday school. There was a mm-hmm. little black church. She would send us over there on the holidays where they would have outreach to the kids. I always like to say I was one of those kids from the community whom you didn't see every Sunday. You might see me on a holiday, or you might see me during vacation Bible school. My mom would send me over to the church, and I'll tell you from the very beginning of praying with my mother, despite all that was going on in the world and whatever was going on in our household, I had a sense of God, I had a sense of the Lord's presence. So you mentioned several times you were the youngest of four, yeah. right? I'm curious to kind of pull on that thread of how different your siblings and your generation experience, you know, life and opportunities than your parents' generation. So what did your other siblings end up doing and that you got the chance to see yeah. and how did that influence your understanding of the importance and role of education? Well, the siblings who were constantly in the house, that would be my sister, Hildy, was my oldest sister. My sister, Beverly, um, we call her Blue. <laughs> uh, and my brother, Bud, like me, uh, were nurtured and had gifts that were celebrated. They were artists, wonderful visual artists, tactile artists. They had the same social opportunities, but um, we stuck very close together, the four of us, the immediate four of us, uh, because understand that, again, we were not supposed to be there. So we had to watch out for one another. And um, I aspired to do all the things that they aspired to do. My eldest brothers, I'll jump to uh, Bill, Jim, and Ted. Bill and Jim both went to the armed services, to the Navy, and learned a trade. My Mm. brother Bill was an accountant. When he retired, he was working for the Army Corps of Engineers, and they named a boat after him. He was a great, quiet, but humorous person. My brother Jim was brilliant. He, as I best understand, he helped develop the transistor. Uh, in his mm. work after he was in the service. I don't really know. It's just something that I was told. But my brother, Ted, I was much closer to because Ted, he went to high school in Evanston, to Evanston Township High School. So from infancy, Ted was around more than my other two brothers mm. who had gotten married and had their children. And Ted was a great influence on us. Uh, he was the first black, the first Negro (laughs) to (laughs) be a champion long distance runner. It was believed Mm. back in the day in the 1950s and the 1940s that black folk did not have the intellect to strategize long distance races. They could Mm. only run short, you know, one of those demonic lies that goes around, right? Ted ran long distance and he went to the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne. So he was a global traveler and had become a celebrity in in track and field. And then he later became the head track coach at the University of Iowa. So the the fact that my brothers took advantage of the opportunities in a newly desegregated armed services that also gained them some education, that had an impact. But my parents so, enjoyed the ride with us. I, I I could tell the way that, you, you know, I could hear the pride brimming from your dad and like to see the pivot from knowing his dad was enslaved and hearing those stories to seeing his son compete in the Olympics and represent the United States. I mean, yeah, I'd be sticking my chest out, too. And You know what I pride. marvel at even more? is their ability after all the fracture Mm. of uh, racism and its impact on the family. My father's Mm. first wife, Grace Richardson Wheeler, uh, was a beautiful woman, but they were in their 20s. They had four. One, the first son died. My father was unable to earn a living to feed his family, uh, My dad Mm. was a chauffeur. That's the job he could get. So he was away, you Mm. know, and then when he was 
at home, he suffered all the berating and, and indignities that a black man did suffer. So that family fractured. And so what I think is remarkable is not so much those um, scholastic and, um, you know, athletic and uh, scientific and uh, financial achievements. I'm amazed that my brothers were able to keep a relationship with their father. Mm. I'm amazed yeah. that my my father was able to welcome my brothers, 20 years older than his next set of children, his next set of children who have all of these opportunities that the older set of boys didn't have growing up in the South, that they were able to love despite mm-hmm. all of that mess, all of that discord, that all of that fracture, as I said, and that I was able then to have as the youngest of the, the group to have a close relationship with them a loving relationship with my older brothers and never thought of them as anything mm. other than my brothers. I never called them half-brothers, step-brothers. Yeah, they were just your brothers. They family. That's beautiful. And and so when we get to you, and that provides a whole lot of great context to understanding, you know, the type of value of education you had and what you decided to do with it. So let's Let's talk about that. Let's talk about um, your education. I know you like to talk about everybody else. You 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 slick with it. You, you didn't uh, talk all this time about other people because you like part to divert. Of who I am. That's true. That's true. But let's talk about you now. When we come back, Miss Joyce will share about her surprising college journey and how she responded to some of the most tumultuous events of the '60s and '70s. That's coming next on Where You're From. This episode is brought to you by Church Law and Tax. Church Law and Tax understands the realities of church work, helping thousands of churches stay informed and get equipped with comprehensive resources on legal, tax, financial, and risk management matters. Do you have a question on housing allowance? Need information on selecting church insurance? Looking for insights on what is or isn't unrelated business income? Or how about some guidance on how to properly receive charitable contributions? ChurchLawAndTax.com equips you for success with access to the most respected and knowledgeable attorneys, accountants, financial advisors, and risk managers guiding churches today. Get the practical information and timely coverage you need to keep your church up to date and lead your ministry with confidence. Join ChurchLawAndTax.com today. Hey, y'all, before we get back to our conversation with Joyce Dinkins, I want to say thank you for joining the Where You're From journey this season. We've had some amazing conversations that have inspired and challenged me. Season four has been dope. But wait, there's more. Stay tuned for our special Juneteenth episode that will drop in early June. But until then, let's get back into our conversation with Joyce Dinkins on Where You're From. So, like, when did you know that you were going to go to college? From kindergarten, from before <laughs> kindergarten. I, <laughs> yeah, that was, there was no other option. Like, yeah, the plan. I mean, like I said, Brown versus Board of Education, and I'm in an environment, and the, and it was important, not as important as knowing Jesus. Okay, mm. not as important right. as knowing Jesus. Let me say that up front. Yep. Not as important as knowing God's word. Not as important as being in the body of Christ. But the education from birth was an expectation. Let me talk a little colloquial expression. How are you not going to go to college when your loved ones were denied and Mm. folks gave their lives to give you access? Mm. You know, we know society is still going to have its prejudices, but education can help you to overcome. So where did you decide to go? Well, I wanted to attend Northwestern University Mm -hmm. in Evanston. Not affordable. And my dad, for his reasons, refused to allow us to apply for scholarships. So we worked our way through school. Uh, We were always taught to work hard. So uh, I decided to go to college where my sister was going 
and I applied to Southern Illinois University, which is a state school. The Salukis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let me back up and say that I graduated from these great schools on the North Shore from New Trier High School, and that alone would afford me entrance into many institutions. But I was just a a C average student. Really? I'm surprised to hear that. Oh, yeah. I'll just say creative people can be disorganized. Yes. <laughs> you know, we that can be true. a little distracted and scattered. I'm, I'm still... I've heard that. <laughs> 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 so I was, and it's probably attributed somewhat to the love I received from my siblings. I've been a social person. So mm. I was president of the largest organization at Nutrier, which was the Girls Club. So I was always speaking and socializing with people, but I was not great in, in math. I was okay in sciences, did really well in the languages, right? So I was just a C average. And here's another one of those situations where my father had to come down and confront the college counselor. You know, Nutrier had a whole suite of college counselors and when it was time for me to discuss where I would go to school, I went to my advisor and my advisor said, well, you know, your college entrance test scores are very, very good, uh, bordering on excellent. Uh, your average is a C. Um, you know, just you're not necessarily meant to go to a big four year school. Just go to maybe one of the city colleges. Mm. And my father came in with his paint clothes on his big heavy work boots, and his glasses. And he just said to the college counselor, this child here, and he described me and his thoughts about what I could achieve. And he said, we don't need your help. And he said, Joyce, let's go. And we, we left. And so I applied to Southern Illinois University. My older sister was moving from junior college to Southern, and uh, I attended there initially, and then I dropped out. I know you're surprised. You look surprised. I am surprised. And and I'm surprised in part because I know you to be a you know person who was surrounded by reading. You talked about your dad reading to you at such a young age. And obviously the test that you scored well on. So you could do the work. But then I'm also surprised thinking about what that might have felt like in light of your dad's defense of you to that, you know, counselor's office and the importance and the value of education. So like... Yeah, take us to that moment of you having to go home. I, and, I, you know, well, was that a big deal for you? They didn't make me go home. I still maintained my C average. Oh. But a couple of pivotal things happened. So this is 1968, 69. What was happening in terms of uh, what I recall is uh, the tumult of the assassination of Dr. King, the war or I, I can't remember exactly when the war started in Vietnam and when we got in, but there was a lot of unrest, I'll say, in my life. And probably Key was a young man that I had met at Southern who said he wanted to marry me. So I dropped out of school. I got distracted. I didn't feel good about all of that. I did feel that I had failed myself and my family. And I'll say that the Lord, by His grace, got me through that time. I took a job in the interim in, in the Chicago area. I took several different jobs and lived at home with my parents and uh, then decided to go back to school. I decided that education, while there was still going to be plenty of injustice in the world, that I needed to complete my education. And the young man that I wanted to follow had no intention of marriage and mm. had gone to California. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the assassination of Dr. King. Tell me about how you heard about his assassination and its immediate impact. What I recall is, um, and this may be off, but it's my recollection, that I was with other young people and um, we were devastated. Absolutely devastated. And I'd been devastated before. I was devastated when I, uh, you know, was in the junior high school, middle school, when John Kennedy was assassinated. 
Mm. And I was devastated as a young person with the continued injustices that I saw Mm. in society. But I can remember that I, in my mind, I kind of gave up. I thought if they could Mm. kill, Mm -hmm. if King could be assassinated after all that he did to try to love his neighbor, Mm. there's no justice. What's the point? Mm. So I felt hopeless. And I was distracted also, I think, uh, uh, by this young man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but I think those things are not completely uh, unrelated, right? Like, you couldn't just go business as usual when certain events hit you in a certain way. I also wanted to throw a brick. I just wanted to break something. Mm-hmm. I was angry. And I was around mm-hmm. a lot of angry youth who just wanted to break yeah. something out of agony yeah. over our hopes being extinguished right before our very eyes, our hopes for a brighter future. I had hopes that an education and an attitude of of respecting others and and being respected, I had hopes that that would have a wonderful outcome. And that had an impact on me. King's assassination most definitely had an impact on me. So like, it's almost like I I can imagine a world, and this is why I thought it would be valuable for you to take us back there, Mm -hmm. that already you have this incredible cultural moment happening of the 60s, civil rights, you know, war protests, and then to have the most iconic figure of nonviolence be brutally murdered and assassinated. He wasn't the first. I mean, I I saw, you know, I saw Medgar Evers get uh, assassinated that was reported i i was heading into high school when uh i watched the fire hoses on my peers in birmingham Mm. you Mm. know i saw the church Mm. bombed with the four girls and and mcnair i saw all of that you know and so it's always the striving uh to be hopeful we strive to hold on to hope when there's a, a history that we have that hope and faith can lead to some good, right? So we strive to hold mm-hmm. on to that. But then we see the realities around us. And sometimes those realities can be very crushing to our hopes. Mm, yeah. So you go home, eventually decide. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to give it well, another go. Well, I first said I needed to let go of the boyfriend. And my sister, Blue, <laughs> right. was very good at that. She said, you need to cut that loose. Don't even hope that that's ever going to come to anything. So I faced that fact. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then okay. with, again, still my parents' love and support, I went and got a, a job and uh, saved up. Mm-hmm. And um, my older brother, Bud, welcomed me into the home where he lived in Michigan. He was living off campus, completing his graduate degree in teaching the fine arts. Uh, This is the sibling closest to me in age. And so I established residency in Michigan and went to school, again, under my sibling's wing to a certain extent, Bud, and uh, lived off campus and up in Marquette, Michigan. Hmm. I needed an environment where the distractions were minimized. I didn't date. I didn't party. I wasn't distracted by anything. I wanted a pristine environment. It was beautiful. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan, beautiful country, very cold much of the year, but My brother loved it. Uh, We used to barbecue outdoors in the snow. (laughs) So I lived in a home with my brother and focused on my studies completely and graduated magna cum laude. Wow. From what school? Northern Michigan? Northern Michigan University. Mm -hmm. Wow. I just studied and worked, held three jobs at a time, Uh, just was full force intent on getting that degree. One summer, I had my first big job in the news business, which I wanted to pursue working as a journalist, as a bit of a writer. 
and um, I got a job at United Press International with my dad's help and a neighbor, a uh, Glencoe neighbor, Cal Thornton, was the uh, bureau chief. So I went to write news for United Press International. After I graduated Northern, my brother-in-law, Doug Carter, Doug got me a job, my first job after college at NBC News in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Ah, so there we go. So, so you're doing well. You're, you know, seeing this success. I mean, magna cum laude, you know, flex on them, Miss Joyce. Like, you, you know, uh, <laughs> you're getting, you know, the well-deserved fruits of your labor. So what are the circumstances that cause you to come to faith at that point? in time when everything seems to be going well? Well, I think the circumstances comes down, if I were to distill it down, it's just, you know, a, a little of God's word goes a long way. Mm, that's a word right there. Yeah. Okay. Of course, the Holy Spirit drawing us to our Savior is the whole of it, right? But a little mm -hmm. word, even though I wasn't raised in the church, and even though my father got tired of laying in the mule wagon while church went on all day long. And my father <laughs> attacked the hypocrisy that he perceived among Christians. And it was um, my mom's prayers that came back to me at age 31. It was that Puritan prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was the prayer, the prayer that I knew. I didn't know really how to pray. I didn't know any other prayers. I didn't know how to talk to God. But the Lord, that little word that worked itself out in my parents' love for their neighbor, despite their neighbor's ignorance and racism, mm. despite wow. their neighbor's ill-doing, my mom would just pray and love people and work and serve her family. The word of God was in my parents' lives. They were it was in my father's life when he would stop and show mercy to what some people would call vagrants. Mm -hmm. My mother would literally would be holding her nose because of the aroma of the person. Mm. But he would mm. say us, move over, pick them up. You know, the word that was planted in their lives, even though they didn't mm. preach at me, they didn't read the Bible every day to me, the Word of God pierced their hearts and caused their actions to be different than what they were expected to be. Right. It, it sounds like your life was saturated in a culture, in a framework, in a mentality that was totally informed by the gospel lessons of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus in the life, that aspect of forgiveness, even if it wasn't explicitly taught all the time. Yeah. The word of God broke through in their desire for justice. Mm. My parents desired us to be just toward one another, kind toward one another. And when I say one another, I'm talking about the household that I grew up in. My parents were not perfect. None of us are. We all fall short. But there was a godliness in their actions that I believe was instigated by the Word of God. And um, they didn't know a lot of Scripture. They didn't read a lot of Scripture. But it was the truths from Scripture that was their predominant model. Well, let me um, fast forward and maybe we can kind of tell the rest of the story through the lens, because I definitely want to get to two aspects of your life that I know are very important to you. There's family and, and there's voices. So, yeah. you know, you talked about the one that foolishly got away <laughs> and left <laughs> you at home. So tell me a little bit about how you met Steven? the one who had better sense than that. <laughs> how did I meet Stephen? Well, you know, I, I did have a previous marriage. He uh, and I were married for seven years. And out of mm. our union, we had our beautiful, magnificent daughter, Lauren. 
and um, we went through divorce. And and neither one of us could take on marriage because we didn't have any semblance of a prayer life. Uh, we didn't have any personal relationship where we could pray for one another. And really, I'll say that was at the core of the failure. Now, after seven more years, I married on my birthday, my husband, Stephen. <laughs> and I suspect that's who you're asking me to talk about now. Yes. Okay. So Stephen lived about 50 miles away from where I lived. I, I was working uh, in the church as a Sunday school teacher and a Sunday school superintendent and raising my daughter, who I had full custody of, and wasn't thinking about having a relationship with anybody but Jesus. I was in love with the Lord. And frankly, I had been blessed by a um, a pastor who told me, advised me, counseled me, make the Lord your husband. Don't get caught up in being concerned about a relationship with a, a man. So that was the path that I took. Thank you, Lord. So by the time I met Stephen, uh, I think I was ready to be married because I had learned how to pray. I had learned hmm. how to have my quiet time and to listen to the Lord and to follow his word. Mm -hmm. And I had a full life in serving at my church, which was Second Baptist Church of Wheaton. Mm -hmm. At Second Baptist, there was a lady named Joyce Granderson, Reverend Granderson now, and um, she asked me, she called me up one day, and she said, are you dating? And um, I said, no. I said, but I just started talking to my counselor about it. You know, I, I would like to have a companion, a male companion, a husband. My counselor and I have been talking about it, and she said, well... I know this uh, gentleman, and um, he'd like to meet you. She told me about him. She said, he's got a receding hair. She said, actually, he's bald. Uh, <laughs> she said, but he loves kids. He loves the outdoors, and he loves the Lord. You know, are you interested mm -hmm. in, in uh, hearing from him? So I said, okay, you can give him my number. Well, little known to me, in the middle of a job interview, which is totally untoward <laughs> and unprofessional, but somehow or other, she asked Stephen, was he married? And he'd said, well, no, he had been married and he had been divorced. He had pursued his family, but he could not hold on to it. He had a child in that marriage, but that he'd like to be married again. And uh, she said, well, you know, I know a lady, she's a little homely, but she really loves the Lord. She said, I know another sister, drop dead gorgeous. And uh, I think she's a doctor, drives a Mercedes and just, just a wonderful woman, you know. But I'm not really sure where she's at in a relationship with the Lord. She, she posed to Stephen, which one do you want to meet? And Stephen said he wanted to meet the one who really loved the Lord. Hmm. So he called me up. I was busy. And I... I said, no, I didn't have time, uh, but maybe, you know, maybe later, maybe at another time. So I was in my kitchen praying one Sunday afternoon after church, and I um, had a luncheon date with someone else who had been referred to me from by a coworker, you know, as a nice guy. And we'd had a date, and he was not interested in any kind of godly behavior. I'll just put it that way. And so I let him know that we were not looking for the same thing. And I hung the mm -hmm. phone up from him. I was, this is by telephone. And as I hung up the phone, I was very sad about uh, what uh, this person who had posed as a gentleman, but who was not a gentleman, about what he was suggesting to me. I was very saddened by it and hurt. But as I stood my ground and hung up the phone and said, I won't be seeing you again. I heard a car engine in my driveway. Hmm. Now, it's Sunday afternoon, and I live on the second floor of a condominium, and I'm not expecting any guests. But this car engine caught my attention. That instant that I hung up the phone, 
I would have missed it if I'd stayed on the phone. But I heard <laughs> the car engine, and I went and I looked out the window, and I saw this person getting back into their car, and it was Stephen. And mm -hmm. Stephen got back out of his car, and I'm two stories up. Uh, and he says, you know, I never come to people's houses unannounced. Uh, my name is Stephen Dinkins, and uh, I just drove over here so that when you do agree to go out on a date with me, I would know exactly how long it would take me to get to your home and where you live. That's my Stephen, mm. all right? That's my Stephen, all right? Yo. He was in his church clothes. Gang. he just come from his church on the south side of Chicago, and I was out in the Wheaton Glen Ellen area was where I lived, and uh, that's how we met, was through wow. a matchmaker. That is great. And I hope at one point you checked your friend for calling you homely, because that is not at all an <laughs> accurate People depiction. always say that. People always <laughs> defer to me with that. But take into account the other woman probably was drop dead gorgeous. But at any rate, right. I, don't, I wouldn't describe <laughs> myself that way. But it, it was like that kind of Solomon type you know, seeing, getting to the source of what someone's motivations on this side, I'm going to give you everything that would appeal to the superficial on the other. I'm going to give you a scenario that only appeals to the heart right. and then see which one you pick. Now, that's great. Well, uh, you know, I want to make sure we have time to hear about the story of voices. So tell us a little bit about how you ended up serving with our daily bread and, and starting voices. Uh, it's a miraculous thing. Um, I'll say that God equipped me through a variety of positions in Christian publishing over a period of now 35 years before uh, I came to Our Daily Bread Ministries uh, just eight years ago. The story is this, that I was preparing to retire uh, from a book publishing house in Birmingham, Alabama. And I was on the verge of being 65 years old. And uh, we had, by God's grace, gained the acreage of, of land where my husband grew up here in Michigan. And we, we could see that the Lord was uh, going to retire us here on that land. And um, the thought occurred to me that I should possibly at least do some project work, some freelance work. Maybe a role with not too many editorial responsibilities. And so I started looking in Grand Rapids for a publishing job. And I came upon an editor's role and I thought to myself, uh, I'm going to apply for that job. And I, in my spirit, instantly I heard the Lord say, no. And it was about 10 o'clock at night. And I also heard in my spirit, go to bed. That's not for you to do. And I didn't tell you to retire, Joyce. All the opportunities that I've given you, all that has happened through your generations, and you have these gifts I've given you. I didn't tell you to retire them, but go to bed. Now, I didn't hear an audible voice. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we can hear God talk to us. We can hear him all the time he's talking. And he was talking to me in my spirit. I went to bed. I got up the next morning was reading my devotions, and I got an email from the Academy of Christian Editors. And it said, uh, the executive editor and the publisher at Our Daily Bread Ministries are retiring. Are you interested? Mm -hmm. And so I went to look at the job description for the executive editor's role, and I could see myself in the role. I gave uh, our senior VP of HR a call, and uh, she talked with me. I continued to pray, and then about a year later, joined as uh, executive editor of the Our Daily Bread devotional. But the Lord had a different plan than just the devotional. One of the charges I had was to acquire writers, including writers like myself, diverse writers, but more writers. We have always had excellent writers, but they wanted more. So I had acquired uh, about a dozen, and they were successful. But I'd always held and have esteem for black writers, people of color. I wanted to 
see more content that would uplift our stories that I grew up never seeing. Never seeing in grade school, never seeing on TV, never saw myself or anyone like me in books, in my classrooms, in the libraries of universities. Uh, maybe could find a few sources uh, that would tell the stories of black and brown people. And um, I never saw us portrayed in the Bible art, the iconography, uh, where we were so much a part of the biblical scene. So I always held on to opportunities where that could be expressed. And God orchestrated that I had a publisher in a man named Ken Peterson who had some experiences in working with black authors. And we put forth a proposal to create a ministry effort at Our Daily Bread that would extend from the work Our Daily Bread had already been doing. So we wanted to do more. And there was a book that one of the gentlemen who had been helping to influence that, his name is Matthew Parker. Matthew Parker wanted to do with our former president, Rick DeHaan. And I'll say it was their vision, but I caught their vision. And I knew that I could help with it. And the book was titled, Our Struggle, Our Hope, Our Victory. It's 90 devotions by 45 or more African-American writers, each expressing a story of God's grace, God's justice, God's love in their lives. And so that book became the catalyst that proved to the ministry they could deepen the ministry mm-hmm. effort. That in fact, not only would black readers, a considerable percentage of our Daily Bread's readers benefit, but alongside the the ministry's efforts to diversify its staff, it seemed like a good fit, a good venture to enter into. Of course, now it has uh, become established. Voices is its name. We say, see us hear us experience our stories. Originally, I tried to make it into an acronym. VOICES stands for Valuing Others, Including Cultures, and Expressing Stories. We abandoned that just for the see us, hear us, experience our stories, and I think that we we were right to do so. That's what we started with, that effort to be seen, to be heard, and to share our stories about God's grace in contexts that will resonate not only with African Americans, not only with Black, Indigenous, people of color, all of them, but also with Indigenous European American folk, young people, afresh and in new ways, want to seek justice for all, love for all, truth for all. And I think about the gift of being able to testify from true stories of seeming hopelessness. Yeah. But God, except for God. And I always try to tell these stories, encourage the work that shares the stories, the testimonies, that point to Jesus Christ as the source of truth, the source of love, to tell them on and on and on as much as possible. Uh, because I, I just believe that's what God uh, meant and means for us to do. Voices, my voice, will tell the stories of my grandparents, <laughs> my great-grandparents, my story my siblings, all with the the goal of pointing to the Father, our Father, Mm. our God, who made us in His image and wants us to shine for Him. Thank you, Miss Joyce, for your years of service at Our Daily Bread Ministries, for starting Voices and creating the space for me and for where you're from. We wouldn't be here without you. 
This show was produced by Ryan Clevenger, Mary Jo Clark, and Jade Gussman, and was engineered by Kevin Burgess. I also want to thank Stephen and Tamika for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries.